Hello friends, welcome. So <clears throat> this conversation, this discussion is going to be aimed at talking about um, how people think that things that are old are out of date, they're not uh, in tune with modern concepts, um, that uh, the teachings of the Buddha, for example, um, are not in line with what's happening in modern society today, that it's outdated, that uh, the rules of the monks are no longer, uh, let's say, flexible and they're no longer uh, relatable or, I guess, relevant to today's society because today's society is completely different or changed and there's, uh, there's this and there's that and whatever else. But I want to ask you something, and I want you to reflect on something that I think is really important, is I believe, and I really think, that wisdom is timeless. So in other words, something that was said correctly, something that's correct that was said even 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, is still relevant today, right? For example, you know, that's why we have cliches. We have cliches because... They're called cliches, yes, because they're repeated over and over again. But they're also cliches because they have a ring of truth. And some of these cliches have uh, uh, lasted centuries. Lasted centuries. You know? uh, so, I mean, I've given many examples over my last few videos, and, and, and I like to talk about cliches because I think things that represent truthful statements uh, need to be reflected on uh, all the time, as far as I'm concerned, because these things, things that are true, ignite ignite reflection and ignite thinking on on concepts or things that lead to uh, not only the truth, but see when when you have the truth in front of you, it clears the slate of everything, <clears throat> it clears the confusion, right? And this is why truth is very important, right? Like so. Like, oh, we don't want to talk about facts. It's all, you know, rationalize yourself out of the truth. Uh, talk around it, you know, circle jerk. Um, you know, go around things. Don't go direct. Don't talk about things as they are. Things like this. See, for me personally, I think that that just leads to more confusion and doesn't settle the mind. It doesn't relax the mind or relax. You just don't see what reality is. That's why sometimes, like, you know, before becoming a monk, like hard work used to always sort me out or like a really good hard workout uh, at the gym or a good long run or, you know, a good hard day's work would always settle me down and put me in a good state of mind because the I would stop thinking. I would just stop thinking and I would just work and get into what I was doing. And then a few hours would pass um, after concentrating for a while. I would feel quite calm, right? So, you know, that's in the lay life. Now, as a monk, of course, we, we, we do a lot of practices to, uh, to go even beyond uh, this state of mind. But the state of mind of being, of being clear, of, of being peaceful, and having a sense of, like, uh, clarity, right, only comes from the truth, only comes from seeing things as they are. <clears throat> now, as far as the rules in Buddhism, which seem to always get um, the elbow from modernists or, or ex-Buddhists or ex-monks or people who um, <clears throat> think that they're outdated or feel that they're too restrictive and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, <clears throat> we have to understand why the rules were put in place in the first place. They're not life, it's not a lifestyle. The rules weren't put forth because um, we're living a lifestyle. You know, to, to, the rules are there to help you uh, realize the goal. You see, and this is what's, what's, what people are missing. Like, for example, if you, if you want to become a gold medalist, if you want to win a gold medal at the Olympics, you have to live to a certain discipline. Otherwise, I mean, it's hard to make it as it is. But to get into the top three, at least, right, and compete against all the other people around the world for the same prize the same goal if you don't have discipline and a structure in other words 
um, you'll, you'll have to stop going out at night. You have to stop uh, taking drugs or alcohol if you're doing that. You, you will have to stop going to shows, entertainment. You have to get up early in the morning. You have to watch your diet. You have to uh, live by a strict protocol, practice a strict protocol. Man, you're living by the strict protocol because there's a goal at the end. So it's not a lifestyle. Lifestyle doesn't really have a goal, right? It's just the lifestyle of the family where you just live together. You work, you eat, um, and you just be with your family. The, the goal is just to have harmony and just be with your family. But the gold medal is a, it's a specific goal. It's a specific objective, right? So you're honing your mind you're, and, and you're honing all the factors of your life towards that goal. So, and if you're not strict with it, if you're not tight with it, not too tight, uh, but if you're not tight with it, if you're not, you know, putting it down and doing it, it's very hard to get to that next level, right? And this is, this not only, you know, not just for a gold medal, which I consider one of the, in sports is one of the hardest things to do, but anything else, but anything else in life that's worth doing, like if you want to uh, save up, you know, if you want to save $2 million to buy a house, Right? You have to watch your budget. You have to, you, you have every, everywhere you go, uh, um, when you're spending your money, you have to live by a certain, you have to have a certain discipline with your money in order to save that amount of money, which is hard to save for most people, right? For the general population, right? So uh, to save $2 million, for example, will require you to, to really watch your spending and how you spend and what you spend. Uh, you'll have to be more ingenious with your uh, living methods for example your cooking you might go shopping or you might go to local farms buy in bulk and you learn how to cook different cook yourself you learn how to use methods that don't use a lot of electricity and thing and etc 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 so you're trying to cut the budgets so the rules the buddha set forth the rules for many many reasons <clears throat> and when you study the rules they have a deep wisdom to them but the aim of the rules is to keep the monk morally morally correct to keep the light to keep the monk <coughs> with uh, uh, karmically correct in other words to keep the actions in line um, with wholesome wholesome deeds right to keep the speech in line with wholesome speech to keep to keep the mind to develop the mind in a certain way that leads to realization and this is already difficult to do because there's a big battle between mind and distraction, right? Now we know the mind and the brain are two different things. They're, they're, they're like chitta, and as we say it in Pali, and brain are two different things. The brain is a computer sort, is a computer network in Buddhism. Um, it is the base of the six senses. It is the base of nama uh, in terms of uh, brain, and it and it and it has a role in function and things like this. But the chitta is a is a different thing. The mind is a different thing. It's not tangible. It's tangible, but not tangible. The brain is tangible, right? You can you can cut the you can cut the head and find the brain, but you can't cut the body and find the mind, right? So the mind is a very elusive. But in Buddhism, uh, the Buddha talks about citta and the states of citta and etc. 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 And and talks about the importance of developing a steady mind. A steady mind to get to a steady mind requires a huge amount of discipline and to make and to stay there and to maintain it and to keep it steady requires one not to be distracted or to go through the senses all the time to be going up through upatan or what we uh upadana what we call clinging clinging to the six senses always going out through the eyes of the ears and this is very difficult to do because it's ingrained behavior it's actually bio biological and as i said before as human beings we're much more than that if you focus on chitta and understand that there is constant um, there's there's the constant round of rebirth in Buddhism. I'll talk about that another time because that's another subject don't want to go off on tangents but the constant round of rebirths the chitta goes on and on and on right so the human being is just for this life you know next life we don't know what what's going to happen right so the fact that the human being it's like a machine that has its own biological network, neurological network, it's cardiovascular networks, it has its own function. But the idea is to go beyond this because we're trying to talk about the, the state, the deathlessness state, right? So to me, this seems that it would require 
a set of parameters, a set of conditions that you would need to live by in order to, uh, to realize that goal, right? Now, achieving that goal is more of a modern term, achieving a goal, a goal medal, that's an achievement. But in Buddhism, it's even harder than that. We're trying to realize. So it's art mixed with science mixed with discipline. It's not so, it's not so, uh, not so simple to do because you can't really uh, consciously will realization. Otherwise, most of us would have done it a long time ago. You, it's, it's a thing that has to come um, through art form and science. Um, and as I said, discipline, repeating those three qualities, um, all mixed together and hopefully at the end of the, at, before you die, you, you realize, you realize uh, the truth, you realize Dhamma, you see the Dhamma, right? You, re you realize uh, the, cessation, the cessation of Dukkha, you're about, you're about, you're able to abandon ignorance, you're about uh, able to abandon craving, clinging, all those factors, right? Avidya, ignorance, okay? So when ignorance is abandoned, Right, it leads to niro, nirodo hoti, which is the, the the cessation of dukkha. Right, which is what our aim is, particularly uh, in my tradition. Anyway, I'm not talking about Zen or other Mahayana sects or things like that. I know not much about what they do and stuff. I'm learning more about it, but ideally, like I don't understand what the problem is when. You're trying to achieve something and you live to a certain discipline. <clears throat> and why this discipline, see, everybody comes to attack this discipline rather than to, <clears throat> rather to just admit it that you just don't want to get out of your comfort zone, that you want to be lazy, that you want to indulge, that you want to have sexual desires, you want to fulfill sex, sensual desires and sexual desires, you want to fulfill indulgent desires, you want to fulfill things that have nothing to do with the goal of the Buddhist uh, of the Buddhist path, of the Noble Eightfold Path, for example, or the Four Noble Truths. Why don't you just admit it, people? Just be truthful, right? You just don't want to do it. That's what it is. It's got nothing to do with the discipline. So in other words, if you go to the gym and the trainer is telling you, all right, I want you to get up at 5 a.m., do two hours of yoga, um, have, have oats, oats and... Uh, oats and milk for breakfast, no milk, um, no, no sugar, no honey, nothing, just plain, right? Uh, then I want you to eat vegetables and, and et cetera, et cetera. Then at three o'clock in the afternoon, go for a run and do uh, 30 push-ups, 30 sit-ups. And then at night, do, um, you know, another two hours of yoga or something for the first six months, whatever, did it. Then you go to your trainer <clears throat> after six months and uh, the trainer says to you, well, have you been fo following this protocol every day? And you, you say, no, look, your training is actually not very good. I don't, I don't agree with your training. And, and the trainer goes, did you follow the protocol properly? And you say, no, nah, I just did it when I felt like it. I did it when I felt like it. And I believe, you know, I'd rather follow my indulgences and <clears throat> stay within my comfort zones and not expand because the, the discipline was ch challenging my comfort zones, my lazy, and, and my lazy qualities, and I just didn't want to change. So I think your training is not correct. I think your training sucks. I mean, that's what most people are doing because if you understand discipline, if you understand achieving something or realizing something, it requires a structure of sorts, right? No matter what, what structure it is, but it still requires some kind of structure, some kind of engaged focus where you're, you're compromising, you're trading off and you're eliminating certain things or sacrificing certain things in order to get to this higher place. Right, so you shackle off certain things to do this. Sometimes, for certain goals, you can't talk to your family, or you can't you, you can't see people, or you can't acknowledge things because you're focused on something. Right, but this is a trade-off. This is this is absolutely normal in things. So I hear these people talking about this stuff, but really, you know, just admit you're lazy. <clears throat> admit that you're attached to your comfort zones, and be truthful to yourself. Like don't you know the worst thing you can do is lie to yourself and tell yourself things that aren't true. Now, remember, truth really settles things. It really, really settles things. It, it, it always establishes clarity and gets rid of the confusion and gives you solid ground to work on. So instead of criticizing the rules and always trying to bring in the modern class, like modern life, oh, wow, really skillful. Look how, look how out of whack we are. We're aborting, <clears throat> it's legal to abort children 
after 20 weeks, it's legal to abort children, for example, right? It's, it's uh, you know, you know uh, multiple partners is okay and everything, all this kind of stuff. Not that I'm at whatever, but what I'm saying is we have a lot, we're pornography, we've got all this perversion and we've got all this stuff. Look, look the jails are full today. Murders all over the place. Uh, our lifestyles. Uh, we got corruption in our governments. We got corruption all over the place. Oh, let's let's tune into that rather than go to timeless wisdom of the Buddha. So, this is where I, this is where you know you want you're not going to get anywhere with me. Like this is where you get the the solid the solid war of the hand, right? You get my hand because <laughs> you get the hand because really. The timeless wisdom um, of the Buddha will last, if the Dharma lasts 10,000 years, I bet you in 10,000 years, the, the Buddha's wisdom will still be more than relevant in the society of the day. Because it's not, the, the Buddha had realized everything. He, he developed the, the, his nature. He developed everything to full capacity, which today, very few people have done that. You know, we've got scholars who are like uh, intellectually or uh, the intellectual fac faculty is quite developed, but we don't have uh, many people who have a lot of wisdom in our society. Like, show me someone who has a lot of wisdom. Um, you know, suggest it in the comments, and we'll, and we'll, and you know, I'll have a look. Right? Okay. So, you know, have it. Try to really understand the difference between what wis wisdom is timeless. Truth is timeless. The truth is timeless. Uh, it's like you look at the sun. You know, the sun's there. There's no confusion. Right. There's no confusion about the sun, right? But if the sun was to go away, we'd be all, you know, the earth wouldn't last very long, would it, right? So people, people, listen to me carefully. Don't blame things that you can't do <clears throat> because of your own laziness or because of your lack of will to do them. Just admit up to it straight away. You're too lazy or, you, you know, you're attached to your comfort zones or you're attached to sensual desires. Or, or you think in a certain way and you don't want your thinking to be challenged or you don't and you don't want you don't want to have the paradigm shift right you're anchored into a philosophy and you don't want to and you don't want to be rocked out of it well that's your own stubbornness so and you will suffer because of that but remember wisdom to achieve wisdom to achieve like total your total capacity as a human being to 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 fulfill your uh, I guess your <clears throat> or to engage your full power your full capacity as a human being requires a certain structure. And I don't think there's a better structure uh, in terms of the Buddhist goal than, than the Vinay, than the discipline the Buddha set forth. Okay? So that's how I that's how I see it. So that's my little my little uh, I guess my little uh, pushback on all these ex Buddhists or people who are not Buddhists or people who claim to be Buddhists and they're always trying to criticize the rules, change the rules, say the rules are outdated and all these kind of things. Look, just admit that you're not willing to change. Admit your laziness and, and, and be truthful to your own sensual desires. Be truthful to your own attachments and to your own defilements first before you go out and start claiming you know, that Buddhism is too orthodox and all these kind of things. I, I just don't, Would you call the training of an Olympic athlete orthodox because it's really strict? I mean, it's silly, right? So there's people talk like this all the darn time. I'm tired of it. So I thought in this video I'd, I'd address all these things and let you know where I stand in it and how I think about it, right? Now, I've, I've always been tuned into a strong discipline in my life. I, I started off with martial arts and sports and things like this. And um, and I realized, and, and, and I had a personal life that wasn't so disciplined, which was uh, over time, which kind of I started to understand that the sober mind and the and discipline is the key to everything because it's not just su su financial success it's mental success it's being mentally healthy mentally sober which helps you with your daily activity and and I'm not just talking about sober from drugs and alcohol I'm talking about sober and drugs from telling lies from lying to yourself from laziness um, from uh, desires all the time, attachments to certain things, attachment to comfort zones. You know, sometimes you need to detox out of that. That's not being sober. You're just drowning um, in in your comfort zones and drowning in in desires and sensual desires or attachments to certain living conditions, 
right, or, or, or features, that's not good for you. That's not a sober mind. That's not what I'm talking about, right, in terms of people just think I may think, make the mistake, I'm just talking about alcohol and, and drugs. I'm not talking about that. It's a lot more than that. A sober mind requires really uh, to be able to see things with clarity, see things as they are, and to be really locked in to uh, a mindset that's always seeking truth, always seeking dharma, always seeking the, what's really going on to get underneath it all, to really see what's going on underneath. And that requires a certain diligence, a certain discipline, and a certain aptitude, and a certain application, a certain consistency, right? <clears throat> and a persistence. So all those things I just mentioned don't come easily, and they don't just happen in one day. They have to be applied every, every day, right? Because we're talking about achieving the excellent goal, right? The excellent goal, the highest goal in Buddhism, right? May you grow in Dharma. Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and share with your friends.